So I would like to start this with a question to you. Who of you thinks confirmation has anything to do with performance? Hands up. Okay. Huh? See here? Fence sitting here? Who of you thinks confirmation has anything to do with risk of injury? Okay. Strong opinion. So we, 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 we did that and we looked at, we, we put this out a fair few years ago now and we got that result. So it pretty much matches what you just sh showed me that uh, about 23% um, of uh, uh, trainers and vets that came back to us thought it's a very good indicator of future lameness and 69% said it's a good indicator. So the majority of you and the people who participated then, and if one of you participated, I thank you very much, uh, thinks it, it is a good indicator. A little bit worse for performance, but still people believe that. And I actually want to know, is that real, or is that one of those anecdotal things that get uh, going for literally more than a millennium? More than two millennia, actually. No, just about. So that goes back a long time. And if you have some time, read this book, uh, because it's highly entertaining. It has uh, a very contemporary view on how not to get cheated when you buy a horse. Nothing has changed much in all that time, sadly. Um, and we find it in all the books. All the books on orthopedics have a chapter on confirmation. And you, you will see those pictures like this everywhere. But I wanted to know what is the science behind it when I started my PhD at the Royal Veterinary College with uh, Alan, Alan Wilson. And other people roughly at the same time started to do that research as well. There was already some data on trotters, there was some data on dressage horses, but there was kind of a paucity on, on race horses. And of course working in a biomechanics lab uh, us biomechanists think that's where it's at. Biomecha biomechanics determines the, that holy or forms the top of that uh, triangle of performance and injury. And it makes sense. So Newton, you know that bloke down the road who came up with those, um, the gravity stuff and other fundamental laws of physics. It holds true for biological organisms as well. So what we thought was confirmation obviously influences how the forces are distributed. And that happens in a horse leg as well as in a non-biological structure. So surely there has to be some science behind that uh, 2,000 year old uh, belief. And if you think about it, to me, biomechanically, the horse is an absolute miracle of engineering. A car, a Formula One race car, has nothing on the sophistication of design of the anatomy of a, of a horse. And this is the proof. So in walk, so simple walk, a horse has to cope with half its body weight. So let's go with the European standard horse of roughly 500 kilos. Will that change with Brexit, you think? I don't know. And it, so it, 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 it has to cope with a quarter of a ton in walk alone every single time the foot hits the ground. If we go up to a simple trot thing, I know you guys don't deal in trot and walk, but you know, let me talk you through this. Um, that goes up to body weight, so half a ton. And then we're going up to get a little bit faster, so two and a half times body weight um, in gallop. That's without the rider. I know the jockeys are tiddly and don't weigh much and so on, but still. So that's pretty impressive. That's like a decent sized car crashing down on a horse leg every single time it hits the ground. And to cope with that, I can assure you, um, no other animal can cope with that. Definitely not humans. Camels and ostriches come close, but they don't usually run as fast, really, or at least not for that long distances. So I, I really think the horse is a, is, is a miracle of bioengineering and uh, we can, talk about that at another day, how they actually manage to cope with their anatomy. Now the problem is, like with Formula One race cars, if you have a fine-tuned uh, fine design, you're also prone to problems, challenges. 
And interestingly, that the same pr principle goes for whatever athlete you are. Uh, so you can be a football player, you can be a marathon runner, you can be a racehorse. You always have this big problem, it's the cyclical overloading. Let's forget about the traumatic injuries where, you know, someone falls over and breaks a leg or something. Uh, it's where it's really at in sports medicine, as I'm sure you're well aware of, is that accumulation of micro damage. And coping with that for a long period of time, and that's why I'm, I'm a big fan of those athletes who can maintain their career, with or without drugs, <laughs> uh, over a long time, I'm, I admire them. Interestingly, the, the racehorse is actually one of the few um, animals, and I include humans in that, where we actually know the fatigue life of tendons and bones. So we know they have about 10,000 cycles. Uh, and if you, if you then put the numbers, the speed behind it, and the stride length and so on, uh, you can actually figure out how many strides and how many miles they can go till mechanically they come to the limit. And it's actually not that long. Uh, so, yeah, so that's pretty impressive. So that was work done by Professor Goodship and his team at the RVC quite, quite a while ago. So we know that. Not that trainers ever listen to us, but never mind. And we also know that what we see clinically, and it doesn't matter whether it's a race horse, performance horse, or hobby horse, what we see clinically is that our problem areas, and obviously they differ between the different disciplines, but our problem areas are the areas of increased mechanical loading. So the medial uh, part of the carpus being less forgiving, in my very simplistic, a biomechanical mind, that's simply due to the fact that this takes more stress. Uh, it, so that doesn't really surprise me at all. So it's always nice when, when you know the theory fits the practice. It's kind of reassuring. And we know that there, there's a fair few studies out there. I picked this one uh, that came out quite a, a while ago where it was shown that distribution of uh, osteoarthritic lesion in the fat log absolutely follows the loading pattern uh, in, in terms of stresses that joint under, undergoes. And of course, confirmation affects that. So all good. So we think it's right. Confirmation affects uh, risk of injury, we think. But what about real life? Let's go into epidemiolo epidemiology. They're the really clever people. They deal with big numbers and, and so on. Scary stuff. Um, and uh, Anderson et al., around the same time I started looking into that, uh, uh, also did the same, and uh, that's what they found. So the relationship between conformation and soundness in the racing thoroughbred, so if you have a horse with offset knees, that increases the likelihood of fatlock problem. Long pastons increase the likelihood or the odds of a fracture in the front limb. And then you also have an effect uh, of the carpal angle on pathology going on. Okay, we can, we can cope with that. Uh, we, we did something similar. So you see the odds ratios in red. So the age, of course, you need to correct for that because uh, as the horse gets older, it's at a uh, higher risk of, of uh, tendonitis. Uh, but when we looked at conformation, the fatlock joint had an influence, the carpal joint had an influence on the development of tendonitis when it comes to conformation. Uh, these data are from National Hunt Racehorses. So we had a fair few horses um, that uh, also had pelvic fractures, and the pelvic angle played a, bi a, a big role. And the pelvic angle was one of those angles where there was an inverse relationship between performance and injury. And that makes mechanically perfect sense, because if you increase your leverage, you get more power behind it, so that possibly makes a horse faster, but it also increases the stress on the bone, which of course then might lead to fractures. Uh, and what I wasn't happy about was that the odds ratios were very, relatively low. So there wasn't big things. It wasn't like you are 10 times more likely if, to do this if you have that confirmation. It was significant, but really relatively weak correlations. And that was the same in, in, in the other study. And these correlations uh, went even smaller when it came to performance. 
Of course, performance is multifactorial, so you can argue, well, there's obviously a lot more that feeds into our performance outcome measures, whatever we use. Uh, but equally, it, it, it was still, it didn't quite satisfy, satisfy me. And I wanted to know why are the correlations between confirmation, performance, and risk of injury not stronger? From a pure physics point of view, they should be stronger. So we threw a lot of technology at this. This is the structure motion lab at the RVC. Uh, we are well funded, not for resource research, although I do think all the, all the people who gave us money uh, to do research like the horse race betting levy board uh, very much. But really the big money comes from the EU. Uh, so God knows what will happen with Brexit, but never mind. Um, and the BBSLC. So that's where the big money comes from and usually comes to, uh, for research on cockroaches because cockroaches are extraordinarily good models for robots. If you want to build a robot, you use a cockroach. Uh, but what happened was, uh, on the back of that, we are very well kitted out and we just used that for resource research. So we took our camera system uh, into some yards and, and thanks to the trainers who participated and we said, okay, let's look at uh, the moving horse. Right? I mean, usually horses don't get injured or marathon runners don't get injured or even run marathons if they don't move. So we wanted to uh, look at the moving horse. This is confirmation. That's the first thing we looked at. So we said, okay, this is the confirmation parameter we assess in the standing horse. How do they change in the moving horse? So that's what we did. And this is just one example. So we looked at the fetlock joint as you look from it in front of the horse looked at how crooked this was and said it was, had that angle in the standing horse. What happened to that angle when the horse walked in mid-stance, right in the middle when the foot was on the ground? And what happened, it utterly changed. So on the, uh, on the left, you see the angle was just under 180 degrees here. And then in the walking horse, it changed down here. And that change was significant in walk and that got worse in trot. I tried to get uh, uh, some gallop data, but that's very tricky uh, to gallop a horse towards uh, a camera system that's worth about 500,000. Well, the horse was worth more, so that was more of an issue. But there you go. So what, what do you do then? So the cameras don't do the job, right? What, what do you do then? You, I really wanted data from the tracks. Uh, so luckily, I'm um, married to a, a rather... Uh, autistic uh, computer geek. So he disappeared and came back three weeks later uh, and has solved the problem and said, there's these inertia sensors, we can use them and I can get you the measurements you want. So uh, marriage saved and um, <laughs> we, we also now have those inertia sensors that are now commonplace. They were in commonplace in 2005. Uh, so that's what we use, so we kit out uh, now we don't need cables anymore, you know, wireless and all that. Uh, very nice, but they're basically that big. We slap them onto horses and we get data from that. So very, very nice. And then something came to us. So if I ask you to go from here to the jockey club and do that quicker than you did it when you came back from lunch, how do you do that? What do you need to do to go quicker? You run, you run, okay. Uh, that's a good idea. And what, what happens when you, when you run, you increase your stride frequency. So you do more strides in a given time. You could also do something else. You could increase your stride length. So you could take bigger steps. That's the only two mechanisms that you can use to increase speed. You, so you can either move your legs faster or you can move your stride length, uh, you can make your stride length faster. And this is absolutely crucial because horses can use both methods, and they do actually, but horses are different. So some horses increase speed primarily by lengthening their stride, and some horses do it by increasing their stride frequency. They, they always do both, but how, where they put the focus on is a little bit different. And that's absolutely crucial when it comes to injury development because there is only two factors that influence how much force goes through your legs, and that's speed and weight. 
So pre presumably your horses are not fat, so let's say they're ideal weight, so we don't want to, you know, change that. Presumably you want to win races with them, so they can't go slower, yeah? You don't want that, usually, I would have thought. Uh, so we can't change those things. But what we can change is peak force. And peak force, so the maximum force that hits that leg, depends on how long the leg is on the ground for. So if you have your leg on the ground for longer, the force it has to cope with, that's determined by weight and speed, right, gets distributed over a longer time. So your peak is lower. So that's what we have on, on the left. If you have your leg sh a shorter duration on the ground, your peak force is higher. So it absolutely depends on how a horse uh, achieves speed on, um, on, on what peak forces it, its leg limb, uh, it, 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 any limb really, really experiences. So that's one thing. So I call this dynamic conformation. Uh, you can call it something else if you want, but I just thought that sounded nice. And uh, we started to measure those things. It differs between horses. It differs between w how fatigued they are. It also differs uh, to a certain degree on uh, how mature they are as well. So basically, you would have to do a, a, a dynamic conformation profile at different stages. And we have done that. We, we have done that uh, for some trainers uh, in, in, in the past to, to look at that and see how, how it changed. Uh, the sad thing is you can't change much about it. It seems to be a little bit like a thumbprint. But of course, you could theoretically use it to identify horses at risk if you wanted to. What also feeds into there is the riding style and speed. So uh, in, in, in terms of, in me mechanical terms, uh, a horse on a rider is three springs. So you have the first spring between the rider and the horse. So that bumps up and down, right? We know that. Well, ideally, it doesn't bump up and down. The more, the smoother the ride, the less energy is uh, wasted on the up and downy bit. You want all the energy of the horse and the jockey to go into forward motion. You don't want to waste anything on the vertical movement. So your spring between rider and horse has to be optimized, and also between horse and the ground. We, we talk about this in a second. So to amuse ourselves, and that nearly led to divorce, right? Because, because I collected the data, but couldn't make any sense of it. I'm, I'm a little bit um, less clever than my husband. I'm also less autistic, though. Um, so what happened is, uh, we looked at the, the derby times uh, before and after the riding style changed. You know, before the Americans brought over this monkey riding style. Um, and this is, this is what happened. So, these were the derby times, since they were recorded, up to here. And then the monkey style came in, and then they dropped quite, quite, quite significantly. And that's because all at once, uh, the energy went into forward motion rather than bumpy up and down, bumpy up and down motion. So what happens, my darling husband published it, this in science, which is kind of the holy grail of a researcher, uh, but he omitted to put my name on it. <laughs> Six weeks, no talking. I still haven't forgiven him for that, ever, ever. So it won't happen. And we, we, we are working a bit more on this to, to, um, to, to get down uh, to the nitty gritty detail, also how much sideways movement is wasted in terms of energy and, and so on. So it, it's still work in, work in progress. And this is where the third spring comes in. So this is uh, obviously a horse leg hitting, hitting the ground. So that's another spring. And obviously different surfaces have different spring-like mechanisms. So that's the third spring uh, where you lose energy and where you can optimize not losing energy if you're a horse. Um, and it all hinges around leg stiffness. If you have, have said, has this ever happened to you that you went down the stairs at night to get a glass of water or something, you forgot that there was a step and you really charred your knee because you just came down on it really hard. Has that never happened to you? Am I the only one who gets hangover and need a glass of water at night? <laughs> Surely not. So the, the issue is, in, people can adjust their leg stiffness. So you can make your legs stiffer and your legs softer. 
So if you run at the beach, you make your leg stiffer. If you run on, uh, soft, uh, on hard ground, you make your leg softer to cushion it a bit more. Horses can't do that. Horses have an inbuilt leg stiffness. Each horse has a leg stiffness. And that leg stiffness hinges around the fetlock joint and that whole arrangement uh, of the uh, flexor tendons wrapping around it. So it depends on the um, flexor tendon stiffness in uh, combination with, the, uh, with conformation. So the leg stiffness also plays a role. We don't measure leg stiffness at the moment at all. Uh, so what we are doing, we are reducing uh, our mechanics onto the mechanical arrangement of the bones and what we actually should be doing is measuring leg stiffness to match because if we would do that, what, if you would have a reliable ma uh, measure of leg stiffness out in the field, what you could do, you could say, well, this, horse, this horse's leg stiffness lends itself to that surface, but um, we don't do it. And the difference in leg stiffness, so this is a horse in trot uh, in front of a fluoroscopy system that measures, that allows uh, taking cine radiographs at high speed. Uh, and the one with the circular marker on, on front of the coffin joint is the front limb, and the other one is the hind limb coming in. And the leg stiffness determines what joint movement you get. So I, I picked the coffin joint here, but this is also uh, the, the, the case for the other, other joints. And what this taught us, what you can see is, so this is just what the coffin joint does, and this is six horses. What they do with the same amount of force going through their leg, how differently their joints get loaded. And you, you, you can see that some horses do weird things. So most horses, the, the coffin joint goes up, goes down. Then we have this horse here on top, goes up, goes even further up, and then goes down. And of course, that determines the force distribution and the pressure that cartilage comes, comes under. So big variations. Horses are also so mean when it comes to research because you have to measure a fair few steps because there's big uh, intra-horse variability as well. Uh, so they can land laterally first, they can land here first, and what if the books tell you that landing toe first is abnormal, I can tell you that perfectly sound horses sometimes do that as well. So you measure 12 steps, you will get eight steps with the predominantly landing uh, pattern, usually lateral, and then you get four steps where it does something completely different. Um, and that's probably, I thought about that, apart from annoying me as a researcher because I have to collect more strides, it's actually a good thing. Variability is a good thing because it means uh, the load distribution is a little bit different every single time. So you don't hit the same, exactly the same cells in a way, uh, or the same bone trabecule in the same way all the time. You actually have a little bit of a variation here. I put this slide in because I'm seriously scared of, of Celia. So uh, obviously uh, the cardiovascular system also, also plays a role when it comes to, to performance. Uh, and that is one of the factors that uh, might water down uh, the correlation between conformation and, and performance outcome. So uh, yeah, that, that, that beating heart, me, huh? And then there's non-horse factors. And this brings me to an end because uh, I was the professor of comparative biomechanics, which means you have to look comparatively. You have to look at cockroaches and horses, and you have to look at people and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs biomechanics is amazing. You can say what you want. Nobody can prove you wrong. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, so what, what happens, this is something that was published in 1970s in the Royal Proceedings in, in, in London. And uh, this goes for, this is based on human athletes. And they did a whole bunch of them. They did uh, a long distance runner and so on. And, and this is what happens. So your performance, and personally, and you can, uh, yeah, you can contradict me if you want, but what happens is performance goes up. If you start training, if you start playing the piano, it doesn't really matter what you do, uh, your performance improves at the beginning quite quickly. And then it plateaus. And it plateaus depending on your ability. That's where it plateaus. So uh, naturally talented people are high up and not so talented people lower, lower down. 
At the same time, your risk of injury goes inversely to death. So when, at the beginning, you don't, you, you're not really at that much risk of injury. But then it goes up exponentially. And this is, this is key, this is absolutely key. This optimum zone uh, is key here to know Ideally, where you want to be is here, where you have almost reached your top performance, but have a very low risk of injury. And this has worked for decades, absolutely decades. And then it, it all went a little bit haywire in, in, in human athletes. And you can tell me whether the same happens in, 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 in horses, because what happened is the discrepancy between the winner and the non-winner got smaller and smaller. And what the trainers had to do, they had to push it to here, which then meant all at once you have a much higher risk of injury for not much gain in, in terms of performance, but that little gain was enough to push, push you on the pedestal, really. Uh, so I think, personally, uh, I, I like uh, looking at confirmation. I think it's a good thing. Uh, but if they're not utterly crooked, I wouldn't get too worried about it. So that's, that's after... 18 years of research, right? I'm standing here telling, telling you that. I do think we need to look more at dynamic confirmation, and this is a picture I'd taken from some Bell's book where he made prediction from, the, from Eclipse when he uh, cut him open. I think he had the right idea. I think we need to look more at the moving horse rather than at the horse that stands around. Uh, he got it utterly wrong, of course, but then, you know, what can you expect looking at a six weeks old cadaver? The sting must have been ginormous. So I would like to thank all our funders, and all the trainers and vets who helped us with our studies, and uh, you for inviting me. See ya.